kind of kind to each other, we'll be gentle. And uh, not only am I excited about learning and getting to some normalcy around literacy, um, but also it's just great to be together. And I can see many of your faces and I hope to meet some new ones as well. So thank you, Pam. It's always an honor. I'll do anything for you. Oh, I I'm know. Here. And I'm so grateful. <laughs> thank you so much. For always, me. always. Um, and of course, to honor Louisa Motz's work, um, you know, as co-author with Louisa with letters and, and a beautiful group of advisory um, people, as well as then the speech to print text that is out. It's just very exciting. Um, from a very early start in my career, Lisa, Louisa has been one of my mentors um, and has taught me all along the way. Um, and I have stalked her. So <laughs> she, she couldn't get away. And so we've become fast friends and great oh. colleagues. And I learn a lot from her. Um, and she's made me a better person too. Um, as many of you have as well. So thank you for being together. Um, and PM, I know this is a slightly different format for mm -hmm. the way in which you do the speech to print. So I appreciate that you're adjusting this for us. One of the things that, that um, I spoke to Louisa about with this chapter, when I said, you know, like, what do we really want people to come away with? Um, and for us, it's really the practical application. So you can understand and memorize what the allophonic variants are. You can do the chart, you know, the consonant chart and the vowel chart with your eyes closed. But if you don't know what you're doing with kids, it's all for naught, mm -hmm. right? So we want to transfer that to children in their practice. So I had shared with you two spelling samples, and I also have a few to the side um, in addition. And we'd like, I'd like to take a reverse effort. Let's start with talking about these writing samples and what they mean for instruction and really get down to that nitty gritty of, of um, the instructional implications for what we're seeing with children's misspellings around phonology. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Course. Yes, of course it is. Okay. So um, Carol does want this to be interactive and of course we do as well. And so uh, my friend, Erin Amy is gonna help me moderate a little bit here. And so um, if you, I know you've been so, thank you so very much for muting yourselves. And um, But we do want you at times, of course, to unmute and interact with Carol and, and the rest of the members of our book club. Uh, so you're just gonna raise your hand and then um, uh, Erin's going to unmute you, or you can unmute, or she'll say so and so. Can you unmute yourself so that you can interact? So we'll do our best to have everybody involved. I know we had 87 uh, registered last I looked before we started, so that's a pretty big group. But we'll do our best to make sure you're, you know, included. We are recording this too, so if you want to go back and and uh, learn again, and and uh, you'll have that. Okay. All right. So Carol, you're a co-host, so I think you'll be okay with the screen. All right. Just let me know if you need anything at all. Okay, okay, no worries. So the first sample was the darker sample um, of the two. And I, and I wanted to, I'm gonna put it up on my board. PM is showing it, um, it to you up here, but I also wanted to you know, say welcome. We are in chapter three of speech to print, which by the way, before I had met Louisa and before I really worked with this content, I knew that as Stone Temple Pilots. Did anybody else? <laughs> Not quite as good as Aaron Smith, but nonetheless. <laughs> no. uh, I did put the uh, links to the questions that Carol posed for us for this uh, chapter study, as well as the spelling sample. So if you don't have them handy, those links are right in the chat, so you can just uh, link right on those. Okay, great. So I think this will be a little hard for people to see, but if you have that link, that would be great. And I also, also can talk it through um, as well. Okay, so here's a student. And one of the things that's most important first is to ask ourselves what grade level is this and what should students know and be able to do at this, at this um, place in education. So this is May, so this is just about toward the end of the year at the end of first grade. So just take a moment, and I don't know, Pam, if we want people to talk about this, um, you know, yeah, like add it in or ask answer, yep. but what should kids know and be able to do by the end of first grade? Okay, so please feel free to raise your hand and Erin, um, just uh, on, you can call on folks, okay? I wonder if it's intimidating to do that. I don't know. I think we have a pretty esteemed group, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yep. Who? Looks like a, Lisa did. Okay, all right. Did Lisa unmute? Do you want you want me to unmute? You're not having Aaron unmute me? No, you just just just, just let you know so we don't Hi. have to talk. Oh, so you're you? Lisa Bola. <laughs> Hi Lisa. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, so I'll start because that hopefully it'll get a bit up. So one thing that they really should know is that they should know their uh, vowel combinations. 
like so some of the the the, sh the silent e syllable type okay. the open syllable type um so for phonics wise that's those are the things like really variant vowels would be the only real thing left in, in multisyllabic words um to go over in second grade so really they should have almost all their really salient about beginning uh, phonics skills by first okay okay and when you say, you know, we're talking about vowel combinations, some of the hard, there, there's so many, aren't there? Yeah. Right? You know, so many ways. So I often think that second grade has the brunt of the responsibility for some of those really tricky vowel teams. And first grade probably has the responsibility for some of those basics, right? Mm -hmm. Like o, o, A, A, I, E, A, so on and so forth. So, you know, when we look at this, um, we want to keep that in mind. And thanks, Lisa, for reminding us of what students should know and be able to do. How many sounds um, should they be able to represent within a single syllable word by the end of first grade? Where should they be phonemically? Anybody else want to give that a shot? Which ones? End of first grade. I'm thinking five sounds. Yes, am I wrong about that? Mm. So we think of Kilpatrick and the top, well, yeah. in the top part mm -hmm. of the hourglass, right? So we have early, basic, basic. advanced, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So if we were to think of the past, students likely should be able to blend and segment. Yeah. In a single syllable word up to through four, I see somebody saying four sounds, blend in the beginning or blend in the end. Mm -hmm. right? um, and I can't wait to talk about that. I have a question about that, that maybe we should pull in in a little bit, but um, or, or we move toward blends in the beginning and the end. That would bring us to five sounds, but really maybe four sounds um, securely to be able to represent when they spell. And of course, to be able to blend through when they're reading. So okay. I usually, what I do and I pull it up, I pull up the, the letter scope and sequence. So. Ah, I have it right <laughs> over there. Yeah, I have it right here too. So yeah, there you go. yeah. appendix B2, B3, mm -hmm. volume yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there you go. Yeah, okay. So, so just anyway, whenever I look at a writing sample, I try to center myself on what we should expect students to know and be able to do. And then we take a look at it through that lens. So the first word is fan. And you notice that that's a mistake right off the bat, right? Um, so you can type in or talk or just think, what makes fan so difficult? I mean, fan is not an easy, actually, I've often thought, hmm, perhaps we shouldn't have that as a, as a beginning um, spelling because of the, well, the allophonic variant of, I see this nasalized vowels. Yep, nasalization, nasal, the A to the A, I'm seeing Abby say that, Terry say that, of course, Jackie say that. Right, so when we're doing a, 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 which it looks like we're trying to represent in the first few words, it would, it would be prudent not to have a nasalized vowel mm -hmm. to see if students can do that in isolation and then perhaps later on, right, have a nasal. So um, we can always be smarter than our tools. Maybe we can add in a word that isn't, doesn't have a nasalized ah. Mm -hmm. And what could that look, you know, that could look like, well, mat, right? You know, or something, something like that. But nonetheless, this vowel was um, an ah instead of an ah. And that might be because they're confused a little bit in how it sounds in your, in your nose. What did you see about the other vowels in those CVC words? Do you notice that mm -hmm. eh looks good? Mm -hmm. it looks, it looks good. good. All looks good. Yeah, right, Pam. What about rope? Well, that's an O, isn't it? So, so this is curious, and I know that many of us know this because we're an advanced group, but in rope, without an E, do you really think that student is trying to spell ah, rap? What do you think, Pam? I don't think so. I think that the student hasn't learned yet the si vowel silent E pattern. So mm -hmm. I think that's really what it is. We see this in that the, the student has a lot of reversals. The P is backwards um, mm -hmm. and the D and the B are backwards. So we see a lot of issues with reversals, but I think the student is, sound, is phonetic. I mean, the phonics are a problem with the orthography, but the phonology I think is okay. I think he's sounding it out or she, maybe rope uh, the, the P is backwards, but I think it's just yeah. the orthographic error. Right. Right. Yeah. And probably thinking of letter name, using letter name for letter sound, right? With rope. Mm -hmm. And then in okay. Carol, you have a hand raised. Great. Okay. Thank you, Erin. Yep. Hi. Um, I was just going to say that I agree with Pam because when you look farther down the list as well, um, shine and blade 
they're also missing the silent E at the end. So there's kind of a pattern to that as well to kind of give an extra clue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. You know, it's, it's important. I, I like your point. It's important to pay attention to all the different errors in a progressive manner um, because maybe one mistake happens, but then they're able to, to pull that up and be much more accurate, which I thought was interesting because this is a little inconsistent. Um, the silent E is missing. And so Lisa told us that that should be there. What do we think about the representation of a blend in the beginning or a blend in the end, CCVC or CVCC? What do we think about that ability? The first mistake with a blend is what number? Does anybody, can anybody see? Which one's um, the sled? There's one before it. Is there what? Um, that ending blend or beginning blend, Carol? Ending, ending blend. Oh, well, ending or, beginning, beginning or ending. Any oh, blend. Okay. Well then, yep. chunk. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. And I see some people saying chunk. So, so Catherine, what we're what we're um, asking or what I'm looking at is a word that has a blend in it, either in the beginning or the end, where does he should be able, he or she should be able to represent that. And in chunk, you can see that that blend back in here isn't, isn't um, represented. And what type of sound though comes before that? Yet again, it's a, you know, a, a nasal, right? And so they represented the nasal accurately up here What's interesting about that phonemically is that that's what's left out here. And that's really tricky for kids. I saw some people talk about how um, we often talk about those as welded sounds or glued sounds. Um, and they're not, right? They have individual phonemes, mm and k. But I would rather that this student spell that word C H U N G K, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And not just, just the um, C there. Well, and I also would rather that they put the K there and not the C there. That's not a phonemic issue, right? But it's an orthographic one, um, right? And that putting that C at the very end, that should not look right. Um, a CK or a K would be the more common pattern. But of course, still, we're still in, we're just first grade. So they've not likely seen a lot of print yet, right? Mm -hmm. We're looking at that. Here's something else. So we, so we see, you're right, PM, to mention the blend and sled. So I wanna just stop, stop for a heartbeat here because many programs um, don't either don't teach blends and then just give kids what they call consonant clusters um, and ask them to read them and spell them without the appropriate foundational phonemic awareness. But Terry, you had your hand raised. Should I stop for a heartbeat? Um, I was just gonna ask a quick question. If you could address the um, back to the word chunk yeah with the nasal but then louisa said something interesting in the book with regard to a voiceless stop at the end mm -hmm. of a word next to a nasal could mm -hmm. you just talk a, a moment about that please sure sure so thank you for asking that so i think you're referring to aspiration mm -hmm. It's one of the allophonic variants. And, and when you aspire, you breathe. So this is talking about your push of breath. In, in words, when you have blends, either the second position in a blend, when you have a stop, of a, especially a, a voiceless stop sound, or at the end of a word, especially around that nasal, those sounds de-aspirate. They lose their push of air. It's not as crisp and clear. So phonemically, if your, phonolog your phonology, right, I'm, and I'm going to use my left hemisphere on my hand, your phonology is not secure in its representation of those sounds, really nice and, and, and accurate and automatic, it easily leaves out those sounds. It doesn't perceive them as easily. So when, when you're around a nasal, when you're at the end of a word, or you're embedded in the second position in a blend, for all people, not just people that are dyslexic or struggling, that's a harder sound to perceive and produce. Yeah, I had I I knew about the aspiration, but I thought I remembered reading something in particular with regard to the nasal mm -hmm. and a voiceless stop sound at the end of the word mm -hmm. makes that um, nasal sound even disappear more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, and it would be like like this piece right in here. I mean, yes. nasals are, are tricky. So it's this sound that's hard in the beginning of a blend, and it's this, this piece, nasal or not, actually. So if you have, well, 
but if you have a word like camp, there's a good example of students who would often, if they're having trouble with representing all those phonemes, would spell it C-A-P, wouldn't they? Right? Yep. And somebody, Tiffany, was, was saying that too. So we have, let's see. Is it, oh, yeah, oh, see, he's camping. And of course, there was a, a harder memory trace, a bigger phonology, a phonological load in having to remember the inflected ending ing, which, which they didn't do accurately. But that nasal is missing right there. And Tiffany nicely noticed that as well. So that's another example, Terry, of what you're, what you're noticing. I think it was on page 75, uh, Terry, what you were talking about. So it's so page 75, uh, first. Uh, full paragraph after the list. It says the nasalization yes. phenomenon becomes important in understanding one of the most common characteristics of children's early spelling and the spelling errors of children who are not good spellers. Frequently, these children omit the nasal consonant in a word when the nasal comes before a final stop consonant and after a vowel. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that, that was it, Pam. Yeah. I, I yeah. just remember okay. reading that. Yeah. <laughs> when you said I was like, oh, I remember that too. I have it underlined, so there you go. <laughs> So it's funny because I had another little question. I didn't ask a question about this in our questions, but I had another little wonder about this here. And I don't know if Louise is on or if we can talk about this ourselves, but the one that I wondered about was sing. And I was confused by that. Um, and, and I didn't ask, ask about that. So I understand like want has the nasal and then the last unvoiced stop t friend well look at they they stuck they left out the liquid r right in that second position in that blend in the front and also the nasal at the end sad sand that makes sense it's kind of like cap camp and in sing unless you are articulating that word sing which shouldn't be mm -hmm. then the last phoneme is mm, and there's no stop sound after that right there right. should not be a there's no g at the, at the no. end of that, so when we say sing, um, I wondered if this was referring to kids who misarticulate that. So there's a g at the end and they leave out the n, but I didn't find that that was a, an example. It didn't feel like a, an example um, similar to all the others that we had in this list. Okay, so is Louisa on? I, she did, she did uh, uh, send an email. I don't know if that's fair, if that's a fair enough. I don't know, is if Louisa's on. We're yeah, done. I'm here. What's that? I can't resist. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Louisa. <laughs> yeah, I'm, e I'm eating this up. <laughs> um, Help me with sing. <laughs> okay, well, what's, ha what's happening is the, the, f the nasal feature of that, of that final, uh, the, the final consonant is lost and the, and the, the, um, same position of articulation is preserved by the student putting putting the g there but it's, it's slightly different from the other examples you're right because there's no additional consonant there okay. it's just another example of the nasal feature being lost okay thank you because it rides on the vowel right the nasality rides on the vowel that precedes it mm -hmm. and then um but the student still got the tongue up in the back of the throat right Right. So, well, so an, exa an example in that, that category, though, might be sink, and they spell it yeah. as a K, right? That, that would be a more, uh, just a more con a, an example consistent with the other ones there. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Thank you, though. I understand this. Yeah. Yep. Got it. Okay. okay. Goodbye, you guys. I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to call on you again. This is cool. Okay. We are. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> Doing great. <laughs> no pressure. No. All right. Um, okay. So we've we've talked about words with blends in the beginning, blends in the end, the silent e missing. Some of the blends there, some not. Right. Um, and of course, the vowel teams not always. Um, you know, in number ten with shine, it's interesting because when a student doesn't um, spell the um, sh correctly and puts an s. How are we, how, and this is like a rhetorical question for you to um, think about, how are we supposed to know if this is a phonological issue or an orthographic issue that the student didn't know how to spell that digraph? How would you know? Is Amy have her hand raised, Erin? Is Amy? Amy, yeah. Amy, yes, Amy does. 
Go ahead and unmute. Go, Amy. <laughs> unmute. Go, Amy. My question was more about fan and clapped, but um, I wondered, just thinking about your, your rhetorical question, is that would you know because you could look at other words that they spelled with S, oh. um, like lead or stick? Mm -hmm. They do, in fact, hear the, the S sounds and that perhaps mm -hmm. SH is not yet secure or they forgot that there should be an H there. Um, right. Making me think it's more of an orthographic error than a, than a phonological one. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm still unclear as to why fan and clapped, like why would those not be considered orthographic mistakes versus phonological? Oh, okay. So fan why that's not, you're asking why that's a, a phonological mistake, fan? Yes, versus an orthographic one. Oh, okay, great. Considering that all of the other vowels are pretty solid, seemingly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that word in particular, whenever you have um, a mistake in the representation of a sound, and it's not, com it, like this is nasalization, so that is a little bit distorted, but it's an eh that goes up in your nose with the n. Mm, it's, it's, that vowel goes through your nose in anticipation of having to say that n sound. So it's not a good ah, but it's clearly not an ah. It's not fawn, right? So if the student's putting an o oh there, it, it, he, they're having a hard time perceiving the difference between ah and that nasalized ah. And that's a phonological confusion. So that's the, is that the same with the word clapped, where there's also an o? Oh? So let's see where's clapped here. Clapped is, yeah, right here. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. Nice, nice observation. And what's interesting, too, is when words get longer, his phonology st starts to fall apart because they've represented blends here, blends here, but now you bring up a nice point. In clapped, they, he dropped that blend right in the beginning, mm -hmm. right, right in here, that ooh, that liquid sound right in here. And then, of course... Of course, the other thing we would say about this is not only is there phonological omish, omissions, but there's morphology too. And when we look at spelling mistakes, we sometimes think it's just a phonology, phonological issue or an orthographic one, but we have to account for morphology as well. And then knowing that ED is how you spell the inflected ending, regardless of whether it sounds like t or d or id, is an important layer of language. And children in first grade should know that. We didn't talk about morphemes, but ed, the inflected endings, ing, s, and es, that's part of first grade too, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. he did spell shouted with a sh. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. That is interesting. But would you would you watch him articulate the word shine? Uh, would you would that be one thing you might do? Would watch him say shine and see and. With a little, see what his mouth is doing, and do you know what I'm saying? Would you? Yeah, would you, know, one thing? you know what I would do just to cut right to the chase, if I could. When when a student spells shine like that, and I see that there are other no other issues with that digraph, I'd say, say shine, shine. What's shine. the sound in shine? And if he says, then I know I'm in trouble phonologically. But if they say shh, then I say nice job. Do you remember how we represent that? Oh yeah, it's a digraph, two letters, one sound, s h. Check your work. Mm -hmm. So that's an orthographic mm -hmm. issue. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting that he doesn't spell, I'm sorry, I keep calling this person as a he, this child, <laughs> spells it uh, correctly and shouted, but mm -hmm. not shine. So just interesting. Yep. Well, and here's the other, the other thought, too, um, is that sometimes kids do this when they're doing spelling. <laughs> no, that doesn't happen. <laughs> Lisa, that could be it. Lisa has her hand raised and- Oh, sorry. No, it's okay. So I just have a quick follow-up question. Um, in thinking about this student, and this is question six, so if you want me to wait, you know my brain always is asking things in the wrong order, but would this be a student that we really should look at like a, a Lyndon Mood Bell? How does that sound feel in your mouth? Where is it happening? Because in sh both being continuance, keep, and then I looked and I looked down and I saw growl and I saw um, talk, like, like some of those snowing versus snowy. You know, the error correction in lips is you wrote fawn. I asked for fan. How would you, what, 
where's the change or what's the error? Mm -hmm. And then they identify the error and swap it out. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that what you're seeing in, in some of these phonological shifting sounds for this little person? Is that what we're seeing? Like more of a, he's not feeling it right or is it a not hearing it at all? So um, here's, here's what I want to back up and say, um, Lisa, that that there's a continuum, right, a scope and sequence. And I want us to be thoughtful of, I wouldn't jump to address all of these errors. I would actually want to stop and ask ourselves, what is the easiest, earliest skill that we expect that he should have that he's making mistakes with, and then go there. And for phonemic awareness, he is consistent um, with C, V, C, except for that ah, ah, and we're going to have to, you know, so I'm going to teach him nasals. I'm going to teach, you know, I would teach him mm, 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 go for all three of them and explain that the vowel sound that precedes it is getting distorted, right? That the airflow goes through your nose to clean that up in the, in a C, V, C part. But then I also would want to be sure that he is consistent with blends because when he is here in dream and in stick, but he wasn't in sled, right? And he was not in blade. I think he was practicing his BDs <laughs> in blade. He makes me laugh. Mm -hmm. um, he did okay in fright, but you're right. Now he drops it in snowing, you see? Right. So, so CVC, but now I want to go blend in the beginning, blend in the end. And so I'm going to use my, you know, um, my little chips or blocks or whatever. And I'm going to do something like this. Um, say slip. So I'm going to say slip, slip, slip. tap it. How many sounds did you hear? Four. So we're going to put four up here. And when I do something like that, I'm going to ask him specifically what sound, everyone, what sound is this one? Oh. Good. And what word is that one, everyone? Slip. Slip. And I might just go out of order. I'd say, what sound? Oh. What oh. sound? Point to s. And hopefully you'd point there. And again, that word is slip. So now I'm going to go to a nonsense word and let's make that stip. So just think for a moment, why did I change that from slip to stip? I could have said slack. I could have done a lot of other changes, right? Because there's why not, did I, the change in the not the liquid. Say, say that again, Pam. Because the, the child was having problems with the, the sound, uh, the phoneme in the second position, oh, oh. and you were trying to uh, draw their attention to that position, that yep. phoneme position. Yep, yep. So I don't need to change this first one. He's been very consistent in, re in representing that throughout, right? So except for that one S and SH, which we think is an anomaly in that word, um, you know, in shine. But, um, and the ending sounds are pretty well represented, but this sound here, with a blend, when it's a blend, or this sound here, if there was a blend and that was my vowel, those are the areas that I'm gonna go through and, and go after. So I'm gonna take out a sound in here and put a different sound in there, or a different color, a different sound, and ask him what that is, and if he gets it wrong, what does it look like, what does it feel, feel like? And you know, you can even do this, of course we have to talk about this now, remotely. Today, I'm, I'm having so much fun. I work, I work with a second grader, now I, I had a fifth, I have a fifth grader and now I have a second grader. Um, is, that is that the little brother? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I thought so, okay. <laughs> oh, pretty soon you're on the whole family. Well, well, that's the family. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Except, yeah. Except that the dad. Yes, I know, that's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. He has, has had real trouble learning to read. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so it was really fun because he literally cannot distinguish between a, i, and ah, those are the three vowel phonemes that I was working with. But interestingly enough, he can do two sounds, but he can't do three phonemes. And then he gets really tripped up with ah, ah, i. So we have, you know, even though we're doing virtually, I, I put on my, you know, my lipstick and I get my mouth right, ah, you know, here. Uh -huh. I do. And he giggles and that keeps his attention. And we say, okay, so for I, I want you to put your fingernail between your teeth and smile. Right. I. And what's curious is every time he's reading and spelling now, he goes like this. Like he, he just spelled hit. Writes an H and then he goes, I. and then he writes an I. Mm -hmm. Right. So he's Isn't using that awesome. 
It is awesome. It's yeah, so he's, awesome. Yeah. Uh -huh. He's using that scaffolding temporarily and then eventually right. I'll get his fingers out of his mouth, but he needs them in his mouth. So mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that he needs a full lips program really, but um, you know, any expert teacher that knows that content can pull that in a little bit and then pull it away when they don't need it any longer. Mm -hmm. And his brother had horrible time with nasals. So we went all through in liquids. So we talked about ooh, and where you put your tongue and what that feels like. And we played with the R. This student right here just has slightly different issues. And it's in that blend position here and there. Once we get that going though, with a four sound, we got to keep going. So we'd go to five sounds and six sounds and make sure that all of that is cleaned up in here. Right. Anna, did I see your hand raised? I thought I saw a hand raised. Did anyone have their hand raised? I didn't want to ignore anybody. I thought I saw Anna did. No, I was clapping. Oh, I, okay. I wasn't sure if it was hand raising or clapping, but <laughs> thank you for the clapping uh, for Carol. <laughs> oh, I agree. <laughs> no, no, no. For all of us, look at this is a, a fun conversation. I, I want to apologize. I can't keep track of all the comments over here, but are you, Aaron? Kind of, I'm assuming Aaron is able to do that because mm -hmm. there's a whole lot of good stuff that you're talking yeah. about over here that I'm not catching. So, um, should I stop I for a part? kicked out. Pam, so I lost the rest of the chat, but I'm trying to okay. stay connected. Okay, um, so let me just uh, uh, review what's on the chat. There's a lot of talk about when we were talking about the nasalization, nasalization of the vowel and welded sounds. Um, I think uh, we brought up those orthographic difficulty segmenting, nasal sounds, also on camp. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Um, Yes, and then uh, Anna said, I wonder if they are, if they are articulate, articulating shh correctly, and we talked about that. Oh, yep, yep, okay, good, yeah. good, yeah. good. Yep. Okay. All right. You. You. Okay. All right, so I love this, and we could, um, you know, I have another example, but what I think I'd like to do now mm -hmm. uh, is let's go to some of the questions that I had posed, because some okay. of those questions embed ideas okay. um, about what might happen and then if we have an opportunity we'll come back to the second writing sample um, and if not you know whatever we don't finish in an hour we can continue I think right Pam mm -hmm. to kind of um, I don't know can can we do that on Facebook just like oh absolutely yes yeah. Okay. yeah we oh. usually do uh, after the chat we usually the the week between the two I usually post things or people usually keep the conversation going so absolutely we can okay and, yeah. So the first question, do you want me to just say yep. the first question? All right, so your, yep, your first question was about Charles Perfetti's uh, lexical quality hypothesis. And it was about um, how does this idea support or refute the critical role of phonological skills and their proficiency? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you want me to review some of the answers that folks made or just have people kind of jump in. Whichever you prefer. Whatever um, you prefer. Great. Let's, why don't uh, we just see if people want to jump in uh, and then I will, you know, if, if uh, people are shy, <laughs> I'll just read the answers from the, from Facebook. So, and in, do you know what I want to say this too? I, I don't blame you. Like I, when I was in professional development earlier on, I would be in, believe it or not, I would be in the back. I would say nothing. I'd be really quiet, but I would suck everything up. I would really take it in. Um, but I want people to know, especially if I'm involved in anything, I love when you make mistakes. I don't care that you make a mistake. I want this to be so safe because that's how we learn, right? And, and I think it's, um, I try to help change the way that I, that I um, operate. I don't want to say, good job, you got the right answer. I want to say, thank you for the effort that you're making. Because if we don't ask these questions and we don't make these mistakes together where it's safe, then how are we ever going to learn to do it the right way with kids. So I love when people make mistakes and I will take good care of you. So don't worry. <laughs> who, who wants to jump in? We had some nice, some great answers on Facebook too. So if you're okay. the folks who had answered, you can just jump in with your answer if you want. Okay. Do you want to, I, I don't see them, but do you want to want Okay, to I will, I will, um, I'll, I'll share some. So um, Terry, you know, Terry Geisel. Um, Perfetti's uh, lexical quality hypothesis references that the deeper a student knows a word through the layers of language, the more efficient and accurate he or she will be at retrieving the word. Phonology is one of the layers, therefore it is a critical component of instruction and assessment for all students. So I don't know if you want to uh, elaborate on that, Terry. Um, I, I don't know that I have a, you know, elaboration. I just think 
Um, you know, teachers don't often think of teaching through the layers of language. Mm -hmm. And um, I know when I am interacting with them, I really emphasize how important they need to check themselves. Um, you know, to, um, you know, allow the, their, their teacher's manual to be a guide on the side versus making all of the decisions about instruction. But if they frame their instruction um, through the layers of language, they won't miss anything for mm -hmm. students. And they are, are giving them so many tools um, to be able to come back to um, when we're not around. So I, I really, I, I love Perfetti's work. I love, um, you know, how he, he talks about um, those layers of language and, and that we need to pay attention to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, Stephanie Stoller, this is one that resonated with me too. Um, I did have something, I did add something at the bottom there based on our letters last week, but um, it's about pronunciation. So one dimension of lexical quality is the pronunciation of the word. Phonological skills contribute to whether a student simply recognizes a word or knows it deeply enough to use it correctly in multiple contexts. Those who know more words can learn new, learn new words more quickly. Again, indicating how the essential components are tied together and related. They're not standalone pillars. Mm -hmm. That was Stephanie mm -hmm. Stoller. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, I was just gonna jump in, um, Carol, Aaron. Um, having some trouble with my internet, so I'm hoping I'm coming through, but on page 64, I found uh, the quote that in one sense, words are names. Names are phonological codes that are linked to people. We lost her? I do have that one. We lost, we lost you there. I think that's capturing. I'm not sure where Erin where is on that page. I'm trying to find where she's yeah, trying to. Yeah, I'm looking for it too. Um, and I'm sorry, I thought, I thought she. Three, can you hear me? Um, you're coming in and out, Erin, a little bit. <clears throat> okay. Paragraph three, page 64. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found it. It's right at the bottom of paragraph. Oh. Mm -hmm. Got you, thank you. Okay, thank you. Names are phonological codes that are linked to a meaningful referent. I think is the sentence. Yep, okay. Yep, so phonological processing is an integral part of oral language because words by definition have sound, meaning, and roles in sentences. So if we think of the sound, we think of the phonological layer, yeah. If we think of the meaning, we're thinking of both morpheme and semantic layers, right? I guess, and then we're thinking of um, this meaning, and well, and their roles within a sentence. Now we have the syntax, right? The role that a word would take. Whoops, I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think we're, we're having a hard time, Aaron, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Well, you had, yeah, she had some great comments. Um, yeah, so we talk about, Phonolo the phonological layer, the spelling, the orthographic layer, morphology, semantic syntax. And then we sometimes talk about how you put that into connected text, lengthier um, multiple um, syllables or syllable sentences. So we would think about that at the formal level as discourse, right? And then of course, when we're speaking, we use language pragmatically, right, right in here. But these in particular, are the layers of language that Perfetti talks about. And that phonological core is really one of that, those, those foundations. I, I, jo Jody, I couldn't hear you, but I think that you're talking around those same lines. <laughs> yes? <laughs> uh, and uh, okay. uh, Louisa does um, uh, talk about Perfetti on page 220. I did jump ahead a little chapters <laughs> a little bit because uh, on page 220, she talks about lexical quality hypo hypo hypothesis. Yeah. And the four primary dimensions, what you said, Carol, phonological form for pr pronunciation, orthographic form for spelling, mm -hmm. meaning or semantic uh, properties, and grammatical form for morphosyntax. So the reason that I like to talk about this is that I really have shifted my thinking over the years. For instance, we used to have a, a separate module that we talked about for fluency. And a lot of that was repeated readings and kids, you know, trying to get faster, faster, faster. And we're tracking that through Dibbles or AmesWeb and so on. Um, my thinking now is the deeper you know a word, the more, 
the more hooks you have in your brain to that word, so the more automatic you're going to be. And the phonological hook is one very important one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, you can get around it if you're off. Um, you know, like, I'm not sure everyone pronounced Hermione in Harry Potter correctly, right? Until yeah. you saw the movie and then you did. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and and yeah. just, just today with my fifth grader, um, he had the word, the name J-E-A-N in his phonological form as Jane. It was interesting. So he's calling her Betty Jane, although it's Betty Jean, A-E, right? Um, so he was misreading that, but he was really frustrated with me because his phonological form, when I told him it was Jean, mm -hmm. it was as if I told him there was no Santa Claus. Aww. Aww. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's like, yeah. no, her name can't be Jean, it's Jane. <laughs> you know, that. Yeah, it's in there, right? So this reminds me of the conversation we had last week when you were uh, with the cohort. Uh -huh. And Kilpatrick's, uh, Kilpatrick's uh, statement that we discussed, right? So yes. I put that in my response on Facebook because oh, yes. it so aligns with, with that, right? Yes, that's right. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. So you have to have phonemic proficiency, the accuracy and the automaticity with sounds, and then the memory trace of which sounds go with which words. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, um, I wrote a blog, and I'm going to do a, another webinar through Voyage of Sopris at some point, but... Um, it's about phonology. And I started it out by saying that my student came to me saying, Mrs. Tolman, I'm so frustrated. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like, I know, Chris, you are frustrated. That's what I said, frustrated. And he could not hear those liquid sounds, um, you know, and couldn't articulate them. So he, his, the phonological form of that word for him had been hardwired inaccurately. He couldn't spell that. He couldn't read it accurately. Um, and it continued to make him frustrated. <laughs> You know, <laughs> yes, that's going to go on our Padlet, the, that the <laughs> blog, so there you go. <laughs> so all of these forms are important, but, but um, you can't, you certainly need the phonological form as a, as a very strong foundational form. Um, do you okay. mind if I share that quote from Kilpatrick, because it was so good? Please do. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, just in letters last week. I'm sorry that I can't see it. Yeah, so but go ahead. Um, many studies over the past 40 years have demonstrated a strong correlation between vocabulary knowledge and word reading development. However, the emerging research suggests that it is the phonological lexicon in which the semantic oh, yes. lexicon is fully right. embedded that may have a lion's share of responsibility for sight word reading development. In other words, vocabulary may be correlated with word, word reading development primarily because it, because it is a component of a child's phonological lexicon. Boom. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank that was a, that was a great conversation, but I think it's yeah important one and really aligns with this too. Yeah, yeah, and I don't want anyone to go away thinking it doesn't matter that you that you whether you know the the meaning or not the semantics that does matter of course. But he's really talking about the importance of the phonological representations of all those sounds within a word, mm -hmm. and it's it's very important. Thank you, Pam, for bringing that up too. Do you want to move to to yep, uh, to two? Yep, and so um, here we go. Oh, yeah. I thought that was a quick one, but you said people were wondering about it. <laughs> there was a lot of wonderings about this one. Analyze the sp structure of a spoken syllable. Which elements, element or elements, must be present in a spoken syllable? Quick question. <laughs> but it caused, a lot of, it caused a lot of thinking. A, onset. B, rhyme. C, peak. D, coda. Or E, a combination of these. If you choose this answer, please identify which combo. Okay, so um, there was a variety of answers, but most of them were around um, B and C or only C. Okay. So, okay. So let's go to, um, and I don't know if anyone wants to jump in, so please just tell me, but um, I'm on page 58 mm -hmm. in Speech to Print. That's where this came up. Yep, 58 and 59. Yeah. Okay. And hopefully you had an opportunity to do that exercise, you know, on, on 59. That just helps me remember and solidify this information when we go. So 58 and 59. Okay. Okay. So I like that chart on the bottom, table 3.1. It just kind of centers my head with what an onset and a rhyme is. And I'll just ask this question. Do all words have an onset? No. Yeah, I see lots of no's. Yep, good. Can you give me an example, Terry, then, of um, a word that doesn't have an onset, a single-syllable word? 
Um, um, itch. Yeah. Egg. 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 I think it starts with an ask. Oh, yep. Yeah. Oh, I think it starts with a vowel. It just has to start with the vowel and all the consonants after it. Great. So a uh, spoken syllable doesn't have to have A, the onset. And I don't think most people pick that one. No, How about a rhyme? A vowel and anything that comes after that. What if you have a word like go or so or no that ends in a vowel? Mm-hmm. So what's the rhyme? Does that have a rhyme? I say Jody, yes. Jody. Okay, good. Hi. So we, this has been an interesting conversation. So yes. <laughs> so go for I'm it. Happy. I love that. Yeah. So I say yes. It's a rhyme, even though it doesn't have you know any consonants after the vowel. It's still a rhyme. Okay. And does it have to be in a word, a spoken syllable? It has to be, right? Yeah. You have to have a rhyme. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, you have to have that spoken vowel phoneme. So B would be one of them. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. How about a peak? So let's remind ourselves what a peak is. It's the vowel. The vowel. It's the nucleus yeah. of a syllable. So does every spoken syllable have to have a peak? Yes. So that's B is correct. C is correct. How about D, the coda? And the coda is the consonant after. And PM, you're shaking your head. No. Why not? Um, because some words don't have the, the coda. Like... Um, well, again, I would say like a so, right? It doesn't have any consonants that follow the vowel. So there are no codas in that word or, right? Yes? Okay. <laughs> there's a rhyme and there's a peak and there's no coda. No coda, yes. There's no ending, ending consonant at the very end. That's how I understand it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm, I'm hopeful like, Dr. Most will interrupt if this is not accurate. <laughs> Lisa, I'm sorry. For did you sure it is. <laughs> no, I was just making a reference to Maria's B, like her B. The oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yep. <laughs> okay. All right. Yep. So does that right. feel okay? Yes, it does. Yes. And, okay. And, and the reason why. Okay, good. Yep. All right. Okay. I love this number three is one okay. that I'm, I'm working on in my head. So page All six. Right. 60. So the question was, um, based on phonological working memory, what do you observe about the syllable structure list on page 60 of Dr. Moat's text? How can this information inform your instruction? So um, maybe just maybe pull one person that we haven't heard from that responded. Great. Um, I'm gonna have to go back to Terry. Terry. Um, uh, or Stephanie, Terry, I, I responded to you, but I don't want to do that. But um, Terry said, the structure moves from simple to complex with a focus on phonemes, not letters. Our structure should follow the same sequence as we make sure our students are secure along the way. Complexity, complexity of syllable structure is important to consider in choosing words for phonemic awareness, decoding and spelling instruction. And Stephanie Stoller said, looking at the sequence of simple to complex makes me question when consonant blends are introduced in phonics instruction. Good. Yeah. And then Becky said, yes, great point, Stephanie. I wonder if Dr. Tolman, oops, this is good. I wonder if Dr. Tolman might discuss this more tonight. Good. <laughs> I wonder if she would recommend a specific order. So there you go. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> so that worked pretty well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. It makes, it made me wonder. And Louisa and I talked about this um, as well, because, because, well, I'll, I'll preface this by saying there's no research design that is out there that is um, explicitly looking just at um, the blends and when you introduce blends and whether a, a blend in the beginning versus a blend in the end um, is harder for students. However, I was utilizing my, uh, my knowledge about um, phonological working memory mm -hmm. to think through what would be an easier versus a more difficult task. So that's kind of, so I want to say on, from the onset, there's no research that I can cite to say you've got to use this progression. Although, of course, an easier to more complex always, always is um, much more manageable for children for a large number of reasons. But I want to start, I'll start from the beginning and then work our way to the blends. So you have to be aware of one phoneme first, right? And so you have to be like, like my student who's the second grader who cannot differentiate between a, i, 
ah, he's still struggling with that, right? So I take one of those out. Um, and actually, you should tell me, which one should I take out um, and only work on two of them? I would do the ah and the ah. Because and they're, they're, well, because they're so, their articulatory gestures are so uh, different that it's likely the child will be able to see and feel those gestures easier than an ah and a eh. Yes? So, um, well, I think about this, I, which mm -hmm. is a warmer smile, and ah, which is really open. Those are wider contrasts than, than ah, ah, and ah. ah. That's a little closer together. So this, you know, this is splitting hairs, but when children really have weak phonology, you've got to start thinking about it in that way. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I would go to I, that itch, and Ah, the doctor sound, open your mouth wide, ah, because they're wide contrasts mm -hmm. um, to help. But they have to be, you know, aware of a sound, a vowel, a vowel phoneme. And then I know this isn't a word, and so I don't know how people think about this, but I also would think that they need to be aware of a consonant phoneme before we start putting those together. So I might even consider, I know that's not a word, right? Because it doesn't have a peak. It doesn't have a rhyme, right? But but I want them to be aware of mmm or and the difference between mmm and mmm or p and b, for instance, right? So that they can start then putting those together to make a word like at or it um, or op, you know, nonsense words, so on and so forth. And I guess if I am going to do vowel consonant, then I also can do consonant vowel. And these two are harder than just an individual sound because it's more phonemic awareness. And then we're ready to jump into three sounds, the CBC, right, right in here. Um, there's still though, um, many programs jump in at this level, right, and teach words, the phonemic awareness, if they're, if they're lucky to teach phonemic awareness, and then the reading and spelling at three sounds. Um, and there are some differences even at this level that we have to be aware of. Some sounds are harder than others. And we've already flirted with that idea tonight when we talked a little bit about the allophonic variant of nasalization, right? Mm -hmm. Fan is a really hard word. Um, and if you had a word like fad, that might even, that would be easier, right? Um, and if you have the word, like many people would put a CVC word like cat into instruction. And what's difficult about cat? If you know about what is the initial and the ending sound, why does that make that CVC word so much more difficult than even a word like, um, like, like bad or something? It yeah, starts with the, it starts with a stop sound. Stop sounds and, and, and sounds. It, both of them ends with one, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Great. And and it actually not only starts with a stop sound but a back stop sound, which makes that so if it's further back in your mouth and it's shorter in its duration, it makes that harder. So if you're splitting hairs and trying to just get more specific for children that are struggling, you'd think about continuant sounds, right? And, and then you'd work your way, of course, to stops. And then you'd think about front, middle, to back of your mouth, as, you, as you've seen in those prior chapters, the sounds like k and g and um are much harder than something like p and b and m, mm, which are right up here in the front, right? So there's even something to say about this. So here's my, here was my wonder, right? Um, hmm, okay, when I look at, at this progression. So that's the re-sounds. And then, then I've always thought the beginning of a word with a blend in the beginning is easier. And again, I can't cite you know, research. And then the blend at the end was a little harder. And that's because of, phonological memory, working memory. If I were to give you a list of numbers and letters, which I'm going to do in just a minute, and I give you too many, so you can't remember them. Um, well, let's see what happens. Let's see what part of that progression you can remember. Well, okay. Everybody ready? Mm -hmm. Don't write it down. I'm watching. <laughs> no, I, I'm sorry. I thought we were going to have to, so go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 not you. Well, I'm just watching everybody and I'm just teasing you, Pam. So I'm writing this down so I won't forget. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. Ready? So I'm going to give you a series of numbers, and I'd like you just to um, repeat them back to me. Here we go. 
five, seven, six, nine, three, eight, two, seven, four, zero. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Do you hear anybody volunteering, Carol? Well, what was the first? What was the first number? First five. 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 Yep, you got it. What was the last number? Zero. 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 What's the middle? Nine. Seven, six, nine. Well, I hear a lot of five, seven, six, nines. That's great. So you see <laughs> the first part right in here, right? Hi, Judith. Hi. <laughs> um, so it's the first part in here, and then we really forgot the middle, and then it, when we got to the very end, we got zero. I mean, and, and that's also kind of, kind of clever because zero also it sounds different than the other numbers, so it was a little easier to remember. But nonetheless, the first things we hear and the last things we hear are, if it's too much in our memory, it's what we hold on to. Mm -hmm. So um, just from that, I often think that the beginning blend might be a bit easier for students to hang on to, but we're always going to worry about this sound right here, right? And we're going to do like just like we had with the blocks or the chips. We're going to give a word that has, you know, phonemically a word that has this blend in here and just be careful because instead of just manipulating the vowel, which, you know, somebody would say, you know, this is slip, now change slip to slap, slap to slop. That's not what you're trying to get at, right? You know, that's manipulating this sound here, but this is the sound likely that the student is having trouble with, right? So you wanna just be careful, um, you know, to, to perceive and be really diagnostic and prescriptive. It'll just give you that much further than, um, than you would. Okay. Now, Louisa wants to, to emphasize something. Mm -hmm. um, do you I'll see that? that? Yeah. Can you, uh, yes, it says, I would, uh, Louisa says, I would emphasize what Carol mentioned, that blend difficulty oh. is related to which consonants are in the blend. So TR and DR are harder yeah. <laughs> than TW and SP. ST is easier than SR and SL. Final nasal blends are more pro problematic than final LT, ST, SP, or SK. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Louisa. Thank you, Louisa. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Great. And, and part of that is for, because of affrication, the TR and the DR, one of our questions was about allophonic variants mm -hmm. and the issue of when you, when you put, well, this is, a, this is a huge conversation to have at two minutes of eight, but um, when you have certain sounds together and they're co-articulated, those sounds, of course, as you've read with, with um, Louise's text, they, something's got to give because it's too hard to say those. They're too different in how you make them. So instead of rain and t rick and t re which is too hard to say we say trick or treat we affricate that first sound so it sounds more like a ch and this is one thing maybe we can even end on this um note because of our time but also continue talking about this on on um the chat is the idea that when we have these two sounds together and one of them like in trick or treat is affricated there's difficulties with that sound if a child misspells treat this way, C-H-R-E-T, or they misspell treat this way, H-R-E-T, mm -hmm. this is H, they're using the letter name for the sound. Neither of these misspellings are phonological confusions. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. So if we say, Oh, look, look at your mouth. I mean, there's nothing wrong with their mouth. They're saying the word treat because we don't say treat. Um, we say treat. So we have to explain that to them. We have to explain when you pull those sounds apart, the initial sound in isolation is supposed to be, t. it's supposed to look like this. T. And then you'd say, so do you have a letter in your mind that you think of for t? Oh yeah, it's T. Say, nice job. Go ahead and put that in that word, right? Mm -hmm. So when you pull those sounds apart, it's T-R. And then you would hope orthographically they would notice that this is not a, a blend, common blend that we really have a lot. I mean, like I know we have Christmas and so on and so forth, but um, but it's not a, a typical blend, and that's not how you spell the TR, you know, our TR blend. And I would prefer this over this, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but neither of those truly are phonological confusions because that's be due to that co-articulation. It's really kind of how we feel and hear those. Just 
So blend in the front, blend in the end, I guess, you know, whichever, however way we look at this, this is the position here that's going to be problematic. This is here. And then Louise's um, important note about certain blends are easier than others because of stops versus continuance or affrications or aspiration, the lack of a push of air when we have unvoiced um, stop consonants. That's really, that's really very tricky. Okay. Um, okay. And then we also, of course, then we follow with a blend in the beginning and a blend at the end, right? St and stand. Of course, we have nasalization to deal with that. We have de aspiration in here, stand. We lose that push of air and then almost feels like a D, its voice partner. And so that's why it becomes really important to understand the phonemes, the phonetics of our language, which was your prior chapter. And now we're just putting it, you know, Louise is putting that all together to explain when you are co-articulating that you lie a little bit when you teach kids the sounds in isolation because when they are smushed together that's my favorite word for co-articulation for young children when you smush them together it's not really how they sound sometimes so you have to help them with that awesome. is there any uh, well we, we got through a, a bit um yeah. and i know that it's 802 p.m um can we, can we just see if anyone has any questions or uh, would that be all right, Carol? Of course. Yep. Of course. Yep. Does anyone yep. have any, uh, I know we didn't get to all the, the questions, but is there anyone that has a question for like a burning question for Carol that they would like to, to ask? Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Let me see. I'm going to go through. X is two phonemes. In, it oh. depends on the position of a word. I can do that one really easy. Yep. X okay. in the beginning of a word. Um, well, like, like if you, if, all right, I can, I'm trying to say, I can do this fast, but no, I can't. X takes on two sounds typically, either k, s, so those are the back k, s, fricative, a stop sound and fricative, or g, z. So it's, an, it's a logical, um, a logical explanation because X, when it takes on those two sounds, it takes on either the two unvoiced sounds or two voiced sounds of those partners, k, s, or g, z, in a word. And it depends on the vowels that are around it, the sounds that come before or after that. And that's um, what we tell you. So ek sit, the accented short vowel comes prior to the X. So it's an unvoiced k, s. But if I take an exam and I've accented the vowel after the X, it's going to make the X g z. Those are voice sounds. And you'll see kids write E G Z A M or mm -hmm. E K S I T. And mm -hmm. articulation does have something to do with that because some people don't articulate those words that way. Every time I am in Denver and I get on the um, tram on the airport to go to the parking lot and the, and the terminal, um, I always hear, you know, get off the exit. And I want to scream, it's exit! <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want to be rude. <laughs> yeah. Um, Catherine had a, a follow-up. She just said, but what is the argument for it being one sound? I guess um, some folks argue for that at some time, one, sometimes. So. It's not one sound. Yeah, it is not. I know. So there you go. It's um, not. <laughs> yeah. Linguistically, it's not. Yeah. Oh, oh hi, Renee Boyce. So nice to, that you're here. Okay. Um, Jackie uh, Galbally, who's going to be our uh, lead facilitator next uh, week for chapter oh. for chapter on orthography ha, is asking if you wouldn't mind and folks can leave if it would like but um could you go into ch uh, the question for six she wanted to know if you could expand on question six and question six was oh. in what ways does uh, in what ways do kilpatrick's levels of phonological awareness differ from patrick uh, excuse me patricia oh. linda mood bells or linda mood's lips work jerome rosner's work paulson's pre-k work um how do you reflect these pro progressions in your practices so um i guess they wanted jackie would love to hear you talk about that and i will say that um okay uh, i valerie hug is not one we've heard from so she did answer this question she said as yeah. i looked over various resources i noticed that one difference is that linda mood incorporates the math positions i noticed that she seems to attend to letters and sounds specifically and uses blocks consistently to represent sounds I know that Kilpatrick built, on, built upon Rosner's work and references Linda Mood as an evidence-based approach. 
I had not heard of Paul. Paulson before, but I was struck by how appropriate it seems for the youngest learners. I can see how the Hegarty curriculum that we implemented in K-4 includes Paulson's, and she said, yay, I think that it lays the groundwork at an appropriate level for the phoneme work in Kilpatrick's activities. And then Erin Amy said, Lucy Hart Paulson is the author of Early Childhood Letters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, there you go. So, would you mind talking about that, and then we'll just... We'll end on that if you don't mind, but yeah. No, I don't mind whatsoever. I don't mind whatsoever. So um, there are two main things in my in the back of my head that I was thinking of, but of course there's a lot more that many people could say about that. Here are the two things. One was phonemic proficiency. So um, nowhere, like I've, I'm a lips queen. I loved Pat Linda Mood and um, uh, just like Louisa, um, I stalked Pat Linda Mood back in the day and would call her up and she would answer my questions. And so we were fast friends. Um, and she was very helpful to me in trying to understand my first introduction to phonology so and phonemic awareness. And there was never, never a part of the work where you would track and work with mouth pictures, then you go mouth pictures to blocks, then block to letters, reading and spelling, but there was never the, let's get this quick. And so I was working with high school kids. I also worked with middle school children, you know, young adults and then I worked with elementary children and they were slogging through and they would get a little more automatic but it was never ever on my radar um, and there was one one um, clinic in Connecticut that was using like Linda Mood Bell's you know the chaining and tracking with mouth pictures and they also had a, a timing element and I thought whoa that's really mean and now I get that that was missing so that's Kilpatrick's in my mind the phonemic proficiency right? Hypothesis, the idea that not only do you have to be accurate, but you have to be automatic with all of that. Mm -hmm. And then, and then the other piece, this is, this is another flip piece when um, I have, and, and this might be controversial. So it'd be interesting for us to end on this, this note when I'm working with David Kilpatrick's work, right? So I, and I have all his materials and I use, I mean, I've got it right down here and I use it, you know, for my students. If I have a student who's seriously having trouble hearing and perceiving sounds, I need to teach them how to feel and see the sounds. I can see in there all I want and do level H, you know, like H I, you know, like H one or H two. But if they're not getting it right, and I tell them the answer, um, you know, and then I keep trying to do those activities and they get them wrong, I need to error correct by helping them feel it and see it. And that's missing in David's work, and it was really there in Pat's work, right, in, in Dr. Lindemood's, uh, um, in Dr. Lindemood's work. So those pieces I can kind of pull, pull back in. Um, and then the other, I guess the, the, the last thing I'd say, so it's for proficiency, it's the idea of talking about seeing and feeling as well as just hearing mm -hmm. um, the sounds. And then I guess lastly, I would say that there's a bigger um, continuum of pre-K that Lucy Hart Paulson um, you know, speaks to that is not as well represented. So when we use things like like um, Kilpatrick's past, it is not as helpful in kindergarten and pulling apart what those children need, but it's mm -hmm. super helpful, of course, in first grade and, and beyond when we're at the phonemic um, level, which Louisa wrote a beautiful white paper about the idea that the phonemic level is the level that's going to get you to the alphabetic principle. Mm -hmm. And if you are an older student, it makes no sense to go back to all that syllables and onset rhyme get right to the meat of the matter for the alphabetic principle and that would be at the phonemic awareness level mm -hmm. so those are my thoughts with with that um question six does anyone want to um ask uh follow-up questions with carol about question six can you go over that white paper again i'm sorry what was it called and who wrote it <laughs> dr <Sure>. mark <laughs> <laughs> Um, actually, can you, can you clip it or tag it or put it somewhere? Yeah, so I'll, put it, I'll put it on the Padlet, Carol. Oh, that's fabulous. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah I have so. a question that's like a follow-up to that. Um, so when you're talking, I know you mentioned, you know, that phoneme level and that white paper. Why do you think we start in um, bigger levels? Why, or would you recommend to start with bigger levels? Um, in pre-K and in kinder or just go straight to phonemes? And do you know of any empirical evidence, because I know a lot of the, you know, highly used curriculums, Hegarty and Kilpatrick start with uh, bigger units. And I'm just wondering why that is. Right. Yep. No, great. So, and thank you for helping me clarify that because it is appropriate to work at the bigger levels with younger children. So in kinder pre-K and, and in kindergarten, there's an instructional progression and an age by which students should master those skills. And, um, and Dr. Hart Paulson's work 
helps us expand on that. I think Louisa might have. Or she, she does. It's in the. It's in the chapter. Yeah, the progressions in this chapter. Okay, um, great. So if you if you reference the progression, there are ages by which, like eighty. 80 to 90 percent of children would attain certain levels of phonemic awareness and phonological awareness. So it is a bit premature to expect, for instance, that some pre-K children would be aware of, of individual phonemes and of course two phonemes and three phonemes. So it's appropriate there. I think what I'm what I think of, Tiffany, are ideas like say you have a second grader, like I'm working with my second grader. And he bombs everything on the past. He can't do syllables. He can't do onset rhyme really consistently. And the recommendation would to be, you know, to go back there. But I don't. I go right to the phonemic level because I don't need to move him up. I know age appropriateness is that he can get there. Um, and I just confuse him by going to syllables and then onset rhyme and then phonemes. I get right to phonemes and I start with, well, some of this right up here, right, that we talked about. And then I start being aware of one sound and two sounds um, and work through my progression in this way. And I leave the syllables and the onset rhyme for later. You know, it's interesting. Syllable work comes back and this Linda Mood's um, instruction does this a little bit later. It comes back when my students are trying to spell multisyllabic words. So if they're trying to look and like read a word like Mediterranean, for instance, and they say it's the meditancy, then I've got to put felts down. I've got to put something down that's bigger than a block that they can anchor themselves, Mediterranean. And just like I said, you know, like what sound, what sound, what sound? I say, what syllable, what syllable, what syllable? I'm trying to build their phonological awareness around longer words. And that work is appropriate later on when we get to multisyllabic word work. And that's something a little different than the initial syllable clapping and so on and so forth. Yeah, and I get, oh, sorry, sorry, that chart's on page 67 if you wanted to take a look at it, what uh, Carol's talking about. Yeah, and yes. I, and she I, also wrote a great um, article for uh, Reading Rockets, similar. Yeah. yeah, and I'm familiar with their work and that's why I'm a little bit confused because if we can start at those levels with an older struggling student, and I've taught pre-K and started at the phoneme level, and I just, are we wasting time in pre-K and kinder teaching those bigger units? And I know the developmental, you know, it's easier to hear these um, or distinguish these bigger units, but why don't we just pop into phoneme level? Yeah, I, well, maybe, well, two things. And then I want to say yay for you, Tiffany, um, because I want to want to share another experience that I've had that does that in pre-K too. But on, on, if we look at 67, in general, most, the percentage of kids that are four years old, five years old, and six-year-olds, um, well, not six-year-olds, the average of the two are shown in here um, for blending syllables, segmenting syllables, and so on and so forth. However, um, and Louisa was with me at this point, there's a very interesting, um, ex I don't want to say experiment, but there's a pre-K teacher who's extremely precocious. She's very knowledgeable, and she teaches phonemic awareness to her pre-Ks and her special ed pre-Ks which is kind of interesting. So she has the mouths out and um, she flips her classroom. So she was way ahead of the curve with um, quarantine. What she did, which was interesting, was she would teach or show something in the class. She would have a mouth picture and she would even put the letter there, even though she wasn't really focusing just on that letter. Um, and then she would talk to the kids about how the mouth looked. And then she'd shoot a video. And that video would be a little snippet to say, Remember, Miss Ann taught us today that when you make your mouth look like this and you smile, this is the sound that comes out. I hear it in these words. And then she goes around the class and shows, you know, objects that start with s and says, now look at this with your mom and your dad. And I want you to find different objects at home and bring them in tomorrow or tell us what, what in your house starts with s. And then they get to experience it together with the, you know, with their families. Um, and the kids were all excited in morning meeting. They all come in and they tell them, oh, yeah, this word is, we had a snake in the yard, you know, or I had spaghetti and so on and so forth. So, so, um, and that was pre-K and that was special ed pre-K. So I don't want to say that's not possible to do. And I appreciate your sense of um, wonder about let's not waste time. Let's get right to the meat of the matter for the alphabetic principle. Um, the other thing though to think about too is in pre-K, we don't need, we're not teaching children how to read and write yet. We're doing those precursor foundational skills and it's okay that we're, we're working with the alphabetic principle in kindergarten and getting kids you know, comfortable. Really kindergarten's curriculum should go right to a solid CVC level right in here. 
So all that awareness can be can be covered within kindergarten and then first grade goes all the way down here along with many of the other orthographic conventions that Lisa mentioned earlier. I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure if that's convincing. Um, and it's a, it's a good question that you ask. And maybe we should ask Dr. Paulson too, if she feels that all of those are mandatory because if kids can do it, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Lucy's, a, Lucy's a wonder to ask for sure. Yeah, about <laughs> so. early childhood for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there was just one uh, little statement about Hegarty says there's 43 phonemes. Well, we know that's not true. So, there, you know, no curriculum is perfect. There you go, right? Well, and you know, <laughs> if you have three linguists in a room, right, Pam, they would all disagree. Right. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. So, any other questions other than thank yous to Carol? Okay. Yep. Thank yous. Yeah, Carol. Thank you. Oh my gosh, this is this is amazing. It's like a master class. <laughs> Thank well, you. Very, always, you know, this is really nice. It was a wonderful way to see people. Um, mm -hmm. And I, yep, and thank you for the comments here. I'd say thank you all um, back. How impressive it is that that you're all here together learning. I hope you're safe. I hope you're um, with those that love you and that you love. And um, hang in there. <laughs> it's an amazing <laughs> job we do as educators. So um, it's been a treat for me. When people say what a treat, it's been a treat for me to be with you, Pam, and with with. Um, the great following that you have fostered so beautifully and to honor the work that Louisa continues to oh, do yeah. for the country and for the world. Yes. Thank you. Carol. Love you, Louisa. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, next week um, we will uh, do a similar format. Uh, Dr. Jackie Gal Galbally is going to be leading our chapter on orthography. So next Thursday at 7 PM, we're excited about that. Um, just uh, questions will be posted on Sunday again for folks to kind of, um, you know, respond to and think about. And so we'll have a similar format next week. And I hope you had a good time. I'm sure you did and learned so much from Carol. We're very, very grateful. Thank you, everybody. I want to say congratulations. Uh, can I just say congratulations to, oh, where'd go? Was somebody just said they just finished letters? Debbie yeah, Perry. And we, I, see Kathleen, I see Kathleen starting letters. I am starting letters. So. <laughs> Yeah, and next week, uh, Carol will be with us for four days um, doing a virtual uh, certification training. She did last week, uh, so we're so fortunate that, um, that she's going to be able to do that with us virtually. So um, that's going to be exciting, Carol. So thank It'll you. It'll be fun. Yep. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Stay Good safe. Night. This will be off next week. Yay. Yay. <laughs> thank you, Pam thank and you, Carol. Carol. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Pam. Thanks, Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Good night. Take Thank care. you. Bye. Bye, Terry. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> See ya. <laughs>